Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, two man car, John 316, our call letters. We're 10 8 on duty. We're ready to reporting. Well, let me ask you, Eddie. Eddie, are you on duty? Yes, I'm reporting for duty, sir. We're clear for calls. We're 10 8. In hey, Eddie, this is gonna, I, I, I like the topics of today's program. We're going to be talking about Dracula, A. Number B, we're going to be talking about ghosts, different types of ghosts, according to Catholic uh, teaching. And then we're going to be talking about levitation. A lot of good stuff to talk about. Yeah. Uh, let, hey, let people know about this program. Let me, let me tell you, you should cut and paste this program, send the link to other people. I'll tell you why. This is one of the most, if not the most unique Catholic radio program in the United States. Why is that? Because the only place you hear about angels and demons and the preternatural oftentimes is in these, in these uh, secular TV series uh, or on, on, on radio at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night on these secular stations where they talk about the preternatural or what they call the paranormal from a secular perspective. Eddie and myself, we talk about these topics of the not, we don't call the paranormal, the preternatural from a Catholic perspective. So, so you're going to get 2,000 years of Catholic thought. So let people know about this show. It's totally unique. And there's a lot of people that have questions that we try to answer, especially on Wednesdays, Eddie. We, we bring the SWAT team in on Wednesday. Yeah, Jess. You know what? And it's it's just a little bit of personal experience which adds to the show, Jess. We've had a little bit of a, of a, a taste of it uh, through through our, our law enforcement careers. And, then, and even after. And then afterwards, too. So, yeah, I think it's important. important. They should let people know. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Like well, let's talk about uh, Dracula, first of all. I have a small little clip that we'd like to play. It's from Taylor Marshall. And he talks about uh, Dracula for a couple of minutes. I'd like you to hear uh, Dracula, by the way, was Catholic. Uh, Mr. Engineer, can you play the clip? Was this new movie, Dracula Untold, which is not getting good reviews. But I went and saw it, and I found parts of it fascinating, especially from a Catholic point of view. What made me interested in the movie is it's based on the historical person, Vlad III, also known as Vlad the Impaler or Vlad Dracula. He was a Romanian prince, he was a Catholic, and he was subsidized by Pope Pius II. In 1453, the Turkish Muslims conquered Constantinople, and this opened the gateway for the Muslims to begin to move west, and their ultimate goal was to take over all of Europe and turn St. Peter's Basilica into a mosque. So this alarmed the Christian West, and especially the Pope. So he was sending funds to this Romanian prince to fight them off, This is Vlad Dracula. So this movie takes the historical person of Vlad Dracula and then sort of coats it or covers it with the myth of Dracula as a vampire. And what I found fascinating about this movie is it depicts Dracula, Vlad Dracula, as selling his soul to the devil in order to get superpowers to fight the Turks. It's a a kind of a cheesy or unusual uh, plot twist, but that's what happens in the movie. Sorry, spoiler alert. I should have given you one. Anyway, he sells his soul to the devil and he gets these powers. And this leads into this whole idea of what a vampire is. A vampire in the old Bram Stoker tradition a is a man is or a woman a who vamp- has handed over his soul, has sold his soul or her soul to the devil. In other words, it's a demoniac, someone who is possessed. And we see even in the, the Bram Stoker novel, which is a, a, a wonderful novel, I'd recommend you to read it. There's a lot of great Catholic imagery. We see from the very beginning of the book, which, by the way, starts on April 23rd, the Feast of St. George, the battle between good and the dragon. Uh, We see in that book that rosaries, holy water, crucifixes, and crosses repel the vampire. It repels Dracula because Dracula is possessed by the devil. And Protestant influence, as we see in the book, does not repel the devil. It's really these Catholic sacramentals that push the devil away. And we see, especially in the book, that it's the Eucharist. There's some unorthodox things that happen to the Eucharist in these books, but the Eucharist itself is the perfect um, weapon, the perfect repellent against the vampire because the Eucharist is Jesus Christ himself. And that kind of leads us into this theological reflection of what a vampire is. As you remember in John chapter 6, Christ has his great discourse on his body and blood. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, 
you will have no life in you. He also says if you eat his flesh and drink his blood, he will raise you up on the last day. So he ties the Eucharist with the resurrection. So Dracula and the classic vampire, as you remember, they go down into a coffin and they rise up. This is a fake resurrection, a mockery of the resurrection. And the way they keep their life going is by eating, well not eating, but biting human flesh and drinking the blood. So they're an anti-sacrament. They're an anti-Eucharist. And this is why the Eucharist itself is the greatest power against the devil. So as we move closer to Halloween, it's a reminder to us that Halloween is really okay. All yeah, that's Hallow's enough. Eve. You can, yeah. Okay. Let me make some comments here, Eddie. So uh, <clears throat> Vlad Dracula was uh, he was a Catholic. He was born and raised in he was born in Transylvania, Romania, and uh, a lot of people hail him. Of course, the Hollywood depiction of Dracula that's embellished. That's different from from the actual uh, Vlad Dracula of who he was. He was probably not the most perfect Catholic. I mean, he was, he was brutal. And, and, and he was hailed as a hero by a lot of people in Romania and Hungary at that time because he's the one that stopped the advance of the Muslim Turks because he, 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 he used brutal tactics. But uh, what, what are his Catholic credentials? He was a lifelong Catholic. And he was probably, I mean, back in the Middle Ages, there were no liberals back then, so... He was probably a devout Catholic, at, at, as, at least in his religious duties, you know, maybe not so much in his moral life. Right. But we can say he was a Catholic crusader. That He was that. He was actually, Eddie, I read that he was part of an order. He was part of an order, uh, a member of, of, of an order of, 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 a, of a chivalry that was founded to protect uh, the Catholic faith from the invading Turks at the, at the time. And they were the world power at the time. And so... The Pope knew that the Muslims were going to come in and attack, and he he asked Vlad Dracula because uh, he had a reputation. He asked him to come in and to defend Christendom, and uh, Vlad Dracula told the Pope, "Reporting for duty, sir." <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, just that's what's that's what's really uh, lost. In, in you know, I, I know Bela Lugosi and 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 just the, the 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 dynamic of having Dracula in the old movies and people nowadays just they really don't have an idea with all the blood and guts and stuff of the movies nowadays. The old black and white movies like the, these were very very scary, very creepy. But it really doesn't give due to to Vlad the Impaler because it, it embellishes the story. So the reality is just that this guy. Was was brutal, and you know what, Jess? It was necessary. the 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 Muslim uh, Turks at that time were were just as uh, uh, just as Absolutely. bad as he was. So he he, he fought fire with fire. Exactly, and, exactly. And uh, I'll tell you, God used him. You know, he he was a tool of God. Uh, I'm not saying that he was a saint, but he knew that the Muslim Sultan, uh, and, and he was vicious. His name was Sultan Mehmet the Second. And they would they would use brutal tactics against the prisoners when they caught them, and the Pope knew that he had to find somebody at least as brutal as the Muslims, and that's exactly why he 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 tapped them in the shoulder to defend Christendom, because because of his brutal tactics matched the Sultans, he was known as Vlad the Impaler, in history that's what they call him Vlad the Impaler. Because uh, after a battle with the Muslims, after you know a scrimmage with the Muslims, he would take the prisoners and he would impale them. And this way he would strike psychological fear into the Muslims. The next time they would walk in to come and uh, take home their dead bodies, they would find them impaled. Eddie, what is impaled? Well, just in the context of Vlad of Dracula, uh, impaled was where a wooden stake was inserted uh from the rectum and came out their mouth. This is how this is how the uh, impaling was done in, in in those ages in that time in, in the Middle Ages. So this can you imagine just walking into a, a lost battle to recover the bodies and you see hundreds, sometimes thousands, thousands. of Turks. And they were all naked, Eddie. They were they were all naked and they were yeah. impaled. That's that's a horrible psychology there. Now, I mean, Eddie, and me, we're not here. We're not here. We weren't there. So I'm I'm not condoning. Vlad Dracula's actions, you know, obviously he was he was merciless in war. Okay, and that's and, where the uh, bloodthirsty you know, come from, Jess. His his yes. bloodthirstiness came from the whole his reputation. Desi- yeah, him. absolutely, it's part of it. 
And so, yeah, we he gave in to his fallen nature. I mean, it was a time of war. I, I, I get that. You know, I probably would have done the same thing given my into my fallen nature as well. So I'm I'm not going to judge him because I wasn't there. I didn't have 70,000 Muslims coming into my city trying to kill me and my wife and my family. So I don't know how I would have acted. Right. But I'll say this. Vlad Dracula was a tool in the hands of God. And, and you might say that he was something like a force of nature unleashed rather than directed by God. He was unleashed by God to stem the, tide, the rising tide of Islam back in the 14th century. And what Vlad Dracula teaches me, Eddie, is that God can use even the most evil amongst us for his own purposes. And in the face of the ultimate evil, the Sultan Mehmet II, Europe needed, uh, and the Pope knew that Europe needed a, 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 either a rare and charismatic military genius or somebody who could beat the Sultan at his own game by being even crueler and more ruthless than he. And God supplied that person for the Pope. God gave the world Dracula. Jesse, you know, I'm going to even take a step further than that. Now, Vlad the, the Impaler was, was actually <clears throat> very evil. However, what about somebody that's just perceived as evil, Jess? And I'm not going to get into it, but you know what? We have somebody now uh, that's on the scene that is doing things that we never thought where they could happen uh, that people perceive as evil, and his name is Donald Trump. He's doing all the things, right? And uh, this is what, uh, what we have to keep in mind. God yeah, could perception be Perception is everything. Yep, You're right. God could be using Donald Trump as a tool. Imperfect Just like he as he is. the impaler. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jesus 911. We'll be right back. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ, from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Thirteen, St. Paul says, So there abide faith, hope, and love, these three. According to St. Ignatius of Antioch, faith is the beginning and love is the end, and God is the two of them brought into unity. Then comes everything else that makes up a Christian. May God grant that we may attain all the virtues that make for authentic followers of His Son. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Soul Patrol 108, two man car, we're on duty, reporting for duty, sir. Eddie, there's a good article I'd like to share with the audience. It's called Real But Dangerous A Catholic Account of, the, of Three Kinds of Ghosts. Can you share some of the contents? And by the way, the word ghost also means spirit. So it's a synonym for spirit. 
So some some authors like to use ghosts, some like to use... In the Catholic Church, we use both. In the Old Rite, they use the word Holy Ghost, and in the, in the New Rite, we use Holy, Holy Spirit. So Spirit and Ghost mean the same thing. But Eddie, share the contents of that article. Yeah, just it's uh, an article done by, by uh, Peter Kreeft. Peter Kreeft is a great author. Anything you get from him is, is squared away. Oh, yeah. Uh, do ghosts really exist? He begins uh, here. It says, and if so, how should Catholics think about them? The prolific Catholic uh, uh, Peter Kreeft, pr- professor of philosophy at Boston College, gives a resounding yes to the first question and a great explanation to the second. So even uh, without our action or invitation, uh, Peter Kreeft says that the dead often do appear to the living. Kreeft asserts there is an enormous evidence of ghosts in all cultures. The first thing Catholics should know about ghosts Kreef explains, is that we should not try to contact or communicate with them. We've said that a lot, just on Jesus 911. And we we'll say it over and over. Yeah, we'll we keep won't saying, stop it. saying that. Yeah, because that's, that's the first way to open a door that you don't want open. Yep. And he says, any kind of participation in the occult or spiritism uh, is sinful. We are out of our depth, Kreef explains. And there is a danger of deception by evil spirits. This is why when, uh, when it comes to supernatural things, we should... Str- uh, Stick exclusively with God, His revelation, and church teaching. Let's stop there. Let's yeah. cut that. Let's cut that paragraph up. This is one of the reasons why, by the way, the church has actually there's actually a Vatican document that says you can't name your guardian angel. the 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 The, the Vatican's actually issued a document from the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, and the reason is it's just what Eddie just shared right there: danger of deception by evil spirits. Okay. Uh, some people say, I want to know my guardian angel's name. So they'll say, oh, I think I heard him say his name's John. So every day they're saying, John, you know, help me, John, this, that, and the other. Now, angels and demons are so, 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 so much more intelligent than we are that demons are also listening in when you're talking like that. You're, you're putting out your, your thoughts in the air. And they say, ah, he's trying to, he's trying to find out his guardian angel's name. Well, I'll just whisper in his ear that his name is John, and, uh, and that's my name, so to speak. And this way he'll be communicating to me every time he says John. And so this is a danger. You don't know if it's a demon that's inserting that thought in your head and saying, hey, my name is such and such. And so you're going to walk around all day saying, Tommy, help me. Tommy, find my keys. Tommy, bless my children. And it's actually a demon that you're communicating with. Yeah, Justin, and that's, we're going to get into that, I think, on Wednesday. I have a couple of questions that I want to ask, but that's called uh, broadcasting. Broadcasting, put your, putting your thoughts out there in the air, just kind of, uh, you know, broadcasting. So, but yeah, that's something, just that, that, that uh, is, is one of the primary ways that demons uh, get control of somebody's attention. That's how they do it. They, they appear as either a, a lost relative, a, a relative that have pa- has passed away recently, uh, uh, you know, mi- misnaming uh, what they think to be a, a, a holy uh, an angel, and so that's that's why we always warn people about these things. This is the the importance of of uh, understanding your faith and uh, acting, living according to that faith. Yeah, and it's not good, Eddie, to be chasing around shadows. Anyhow, as Catholics, it's just not, it's not a good practice. That's right. If it's of if it's of God, you'll know it. It'll be quite abundantly like the children of Fatima knew that Mary was sent by God. But, uh, you know, there's just a lot of Catholics that are very, very, what I would call uh, superstitious. Curious, and yeah. they're always saying, I think I saw Our Lady in my garage. I think I saw Jesus, you know, in a tree over by the lake. You know, th- there's too many Catholics that just want to see something so bad. It's like, I don't know, Eddie, like they're in, in their mind, they're all, all, almost projecting these things. Don't, don't do that. That's not good. It's not good to be that curious. If God wants to appear to you, he will. He hasn't appeared to me in 58 years, and I still believe in him. But not, actually, I take that back. Every time I go to Mass and I hear the words, this is my body, this is my blood, he does appear to me. Yeah. It's called the Eucharist, and that's all I need in this life to get to the next. That's right, Jess, and we have to be careful whether whether we're looking for demons under every rock or we're looking for some, some sign from heaven, because the reality is most of us, Jess, are going to live in our entire life without a specific... Uh, right. a communication by, by heaven. That's, that's just why, the way it is. That's why St. Paul says we live by faith not by and sight. not by sight. Yeah. Because most of us are never going to see anything either beautiful or ugly, angels or demons in our life. Most of us will not. Thanks we have God. to live by what's d- divinely revealed. 
in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John through the Catholic faith. That is that's is what faith is, Jess. Having faith in something that's unseen, that has not been seen, Bingo. that's true faith. Let's go on here, Jess. Yeah, so, go ahead. So he he basically goes through the three uh, uh, ghosts that he he describes. He said one okay. number one is ghosts from hell. There are malicious and deceptive deceptive spirits, and I'm I'm, I'm corrected by my engineer. The actual pronunciation is not creeft; it's craft. Peter Craft explains. <laughs> And I'm since, glad we got a, a lawyer who, who's our engineer. Yeah, right. That always helps. And, and since they are deceptive, they hardly ever appear malicious. They hardly ever appear malicious. This is important. They the, are, but they, yeah, exactly, but they hardly appear. But right? they, try, they never appear that way, initially, anyway. Yeah. These are probably the ones who respond to conjurings at seances. They probably come from hell. Even the chance of that happening should be sufficient to terrify away all temptation to... Nick, um, Necromancy. necromancy, necromancy, yeah, and necromancy is a conjuring of spirits. Yeah, so just communicating this... with the dead, conjuring of spirits. And yeah. by the way, the the Bible verse that commands us not to do that. In case all of you uh, out there that wanted or taking notes, it's Deuteronomy chapter eighteen. Just read it, Deuteronomy chapter eighteen. Very clear passage. The Bible says, "Don't be conjuring up or trying to talk to talk to the dead." Uh, and we call this in Catholicism and the Catechism the sin of superstition or the sin of divination. Yes, it's just like having your fishing pole in the water, except these are uncharted waters. You never know what you're going to catch. You might be trying to catch a, a, a spirit of a loved one that passed away or, or some other uh, 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 generous, loving spirit, and you could be catching a demon and not even know it until you're well beyond your relationship with this, with this uh, spirit. Right. And even and, and even people that want to like say, I want to talk to my pious grandmother, who was a holy Catholic that went to daily mass and was part of the Legion of Mary. Guess what? You can't. You're not supposed to. Right. You'll talk to her when you get to heaven if you get there. That's why we, we we're called to live in a state of grace, so you can reunite with those people once again. But you can't conjure them up. Uh, this is this is something that's just forbidden uh, by the scriptures and by sacred tradition. That's it. Number two, Jess, it goes from purgatory. He says, this is the most familiar kind, the sad ones, the wispy ones, a craft explains. They seem to be working out some unfinished earthly business or suffering some purgatorial purification until released from their earthly business. Uh, these ghosts would seem to be the ones who just barely made it to purgatory, who feel little or no joy yet, uh, and who need to learn many painful lessons about their past lives on earth. Uh, and this is this is a reality, Jesse. There there are spirits over there that that come to us, and they they don't necessarily uh, communicate a, a, a imminent doom or imminent destruction or death. They're usually uh, asking for help in some odd way because there is a dynamic there where where the the beyond is communicating with the you know the the, the preternatural is com com uh, communicating with the natural, and there's some weirdness there, some some uh, uh, anomalies, but yet there's no impending uh, feeling of doom from these type of spirits. Eddie, also, <clears throat> there's a, this is verified by sacred tradition, this, uh, what Peter Crave says here about uh, per, uh, spirits from purgatory coming back uh, and, and to earth. There's an actual museum in Rome. It's right across the street from the Vatican. It's a chapel turned museum. It's called the Purgatory Museum. And it actually has physical evidence of people that have died and have come back to, uh, to, to Earth and have communicated with family members and, and left them, you know, wrote messages on a piece of paper and left handprints and all kinds of physical evidence, letting them know that they're in purgatory and that they need prayer. So this is, this is established by the Catholic Church. There's, a, again, a famous place called the Purgatory Room. Also, there was a priest here who just passed away in, in, in Phoenix, Father Lauren. He was very famous. He passed away like two or three years ago. I always wanted to get him on the show, but he was always so busy. <clears throat> but uh, he was known as the Purgatory Priest. He was a convert. I think he was an Anglican. I think he had five kids. He was married. Then he became a Catholic priest, and he was very orthodox, very solid. And uh, for about 30 years of his priestly ministry, uh, souls in purgatory would visit him all the time in his parish. And all he would do is pray for them, and he'd send them off to heaven. He was very famous. 
EWTN did a lot of shows on him. Uh, Bishop Thomas Olmsted uh, talked about this priest. His name is Father Lauren. He passed away a few years ago. He was here for the Diocese of Phoenix, but he was known all over the world. A souls from purgatory would come to him like almost every day, and he would lay hands, his priestly hands, and he would pray for them, and he'd send them off to heaven. Some of the tougher cases, he would do a mass for them. But yeah, Eddie, this is uh, yeah, this is definitely part of Catholic teaching. Yeah, disembodied human spirits. That's what we're, t- that's what we're talking about today. Uh, that uh, on this number two. So then, uh, on, on number three, Jess, we should say that uh, Peter Christ. Uh, lastly, there are the bright, happy spirits of dead friends and family, especially spouses who appear unbidden at God's will, not ours, with messages of hope and love. They seem to come from heaven, unlike purgatorial ghosts who come back uh, primarily for their own sake. These bright spirits come back for the sake of us, the living, to tell us all is well and on heaven and in earth, uh, on earth, Jess. I could back that up from Scripture. I know some people may take issue with that, but I, I would just say there's a passage in the Bible that's in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, here, uh, it says, here we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. If you look at any, even Protestants admit this. Anti-Catholic Protestants, when you look at their commentaries, they say the cloud of witnesses being spoken of there by in Hebrews are the saints in heaven who are in some way, shape, or form surrounding us here on planet Earth. So what we call the communion of saints, even Protestants admit that Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, is talking about those in heaven that in some mystical way, Eddie, they're surrounding us right now, even right now as we're doing this radio show, and praying for us, and encouraging us, and sometimes God allows us to see some of them. Those are called private revelations. Usually the one that God allows us to see often is Our Lady. Right. You know, Jess, and that's the beauty of our faith. I really believe, Jess, in my heart of hearts, there's a thin veil between life and death. Amen. There's such a thin veil that yes. nobody realizes it, Jess. And like you said, like like, just, like right now, you know, there has to be so many cloud, there's so many witnesses in this cloud of, of, of heavenly brothers and sisters of ours that we have to stay in communion. That's why we have to stay in a state of grace, Jess, or we'll never see that. What a horrible tragedy that would be to live all our life and not see that cloud of witnesses that was rooted us on man just just yelling at us at the finish line come on stay in the state of grace that's the beauty of it ladies and gentlemen uh, you're listening to jesus 911 we're talking about uh, well we're going to talk about uh, a police officer that saw a teen levitate and a, a real famous book that just came out ladies and gentlemen we'll be right back Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment, you know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest, I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, you know? (laughs) You know, yeah. That's right. If God gave us a lot, you know, and I'm, I have the blessing of listening to all this, I just want to call all the people, you know, I've got five kids, you know, and I don't make a lot of money and I'm still donating to you guys. God bless you, brother. You're amazing. We gotta, we have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the divine mercy chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. Amen. You're a good man, brother. 30 years old, 29 years old, five kids, and I thank you guys. But every Everybody else, man, get on fire. Fight for the truth, man. I know what I'm telling you guys. There's I no love it. Out there. Leviticus 11.44 says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. St. Vincent Pilati said, You must be holy in the way God asks you to be holy. God does not ask you to be a Trappist monk or a hermit. He wants you to sanctify the world and your everyday life. May God show us the path to holiness and help us to follow it all the days of our life.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Reporting for duty, sir. Two Catholics, two Catholics ten eight for Jesus, 10 for our Blessed Virgin Mary, the 12-star general. Eddie, I want to talk about uh, a phenomena called levitation, which is rare, but it does happen. And we'll share a couple of stories. I've actually seen it on one occasion. And I it's one of the it's one of those unpleasant experiences that you see that you want to forget about. And I saw this very early on in my life, probably about the age of 26, 27. I was actually working uh East Los Angeles PM shift. And uh I was starting to go through a conversion. I was I think I'd been to a retreat, starting to open up my heart to Jesus. Uh, my, my, I'm starting to listen to a lot of fundamental. There was no Catholic radio back then. I remember Eddie back 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, exactly. So I'd listen. I'd be listening to Protestant radio and stuff. <clears throat> so uh, I was starting to take Sunday Mass a lot more serious. And what happened? And by the way, the story came out in Spirit Daily. You just put it out a chapter of my book. And one of the reasons I wrote about wrote this book is because Eddie, it's embarrassing, but there's a wholesale denial of the devil right now in our church by some of the leadership. For example, you have a yep. you have a, the great the, the 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 top Jesuit who just came out Father Arturo Sosa who said there is no devil. Okay? He says the symbol. You also have a, I, I in my book I quote Father Remorth the study that he has one out of 3 Catholic theologians do not believe in the existence of Satan. One out of 3. Okay? Amongst the ladies, it's a lot worse. In my book, I quote 17% of Catholics, only, I mean, excuse me, only 17% of lay Catholics believe in the devil. So uh, that's one. I said, you know what? I've had all these stories. Uh, I wrote a lot of them, just had them in my, in my computer. My wife said, just pu- pu- publish them. And I, and I continue. As I get older, I keep seeing other stuff and confirming. 30 years I've been seeing this off and on. <clears throat> so let me tell you about this story of levitation that I saw. Working in East Los Angeles, <clears throat> PM Watch with a partner, responded to a family disturbance, uh, uh, kind of a common call on Saturday nights, uh, was allowed to come in by an older lady. You know, back then she looked like a grandmother. Now I'm a grandfather. She, uh, an abuelita. Uh, she, 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 she had placed a phone call, the 911 call, told me to come in with my partner. Walked into the apartment, saw four men struggling to hold down a teenage boy. And uh, and the the whole apartment was basically destroyed. You could just see that, you know, it looked like a hurricane hit this place. And you could see that this kid, he was a small, skinny kid, probably, I don't know, 13 to 15, small, skinny kid, and he was strong. So she, the grandma told me, she says, my, my, my grandson talks to the devil every day. I didn't really know what she meant by that yet. And uh, so I ran over there to go help the men. And I noticed as I looked at the boy, uh, he was uh, he was I could see his 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 eyes rolled back and you can see no pupil. You couldn't see no iris. His eyes were completely white. I'd never seen that before in my life. I said, wait a minute. Don't all human beings have an eyeball and a, and a pupil and an iris? He didn't. So these four guys, big guys, Mexican guys, his uncles, father, they're holding him down and he's spitting. He's shaking violently. He's scratching. He's biting. He's a skinny little kid. And they're saying, it's not fuerte, it's not fuerte. You know, in Spanish, he's strong, he's strong. Help us, help us. So uh, I'm there helping him. And at this point, I said, wait a minute. This is, this is spiritual. Because I've seen this before one time in my house with one of my brothers. Who uh, I, I just won't go any further than that. And so I'd seen this once before. And so I said, start praying, start praying. So everybody started praying the rosary. 
in Spanish, and I'm praying in Spanish along with them. And he's shaking more violently. And I said, okay, he stopped. He stopped struggling we're all, as we're praying. Said, let him go. Let him go. So the four men and myself, we let him go. And, you know, you've let somebody go. We ha- he was on the air about 12 inches off the air that we're holding him up. We let him go. And I'm expecting him to fall flat on his back. He stood on the air for a few seconds. I actually went down as I'm, as I'm praying. I said, well, what's, what's, uh, why, why didn't he fall down? I got down in a quick push-up position. I was young back then. I could jump, hop down. And I'm looking. He's, un, he's suspended in the air. I don't know what that was called. Now I know it's called. I just, he was suspended in the air. The grandmother told me, officer, he talks with the devil every night. She came and she said, look what he, he uses this to talk to him. She gave me a Ouija board. I ended up, you know, taking it, put it in the trunk of my car and uh, and disposing of it properly. Uh, and we continued praying and praying and praying for about 30 or 40 minutes. I had the whole family praying. I said, get me a rosary. We put it around his neck, scapulars. It was, it's called tree. Eddie, you know, at this point, we don't, we're not trained in the academy to do something. Nope. At this point, I just had recourse to my Catholic faith. I'd, see, I'd seen my mom and dad. They told me, they told me about this. People would walk into the Catholic church and, it was like a triage moment. And so we probably prayed for about 30 minutes. Now, my partner was a fallen away Catholic. He was by the front door, had his hand on his gun, and he was shaking like a leaf. And he was a tough guy. <laughs> he was a tough street cop, and he was scared. And he was saying, Jesse, what did we do? I said, pray, pray. But it, it, I guess it wasn't his wheelhouse. He wasn't used to that. And, and the long and the short of it, we finally pushed the kid to the ground. And, uh, and we prayed for about 30 or 40 minutes, and he calmed down. He completely calmed down. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't any police tactics that I used. It was just the simple prayers of the people in there, the grandmother, myself. And we prayed in faith. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, Eddie. I was, I was afraid. I'd never seen something like this. I'm 26 years old, and I, I know my mom had told me about stuff like this. I'd seen it once before at my house with a family member. That was, that was about it. And uh, I could tell you that prayer did work at least for a, a little while to what I would call uh, at least to probably drive out that evil spirit temporarily. He probably got temporary relief. I told the, the mom, uh, the grandmother, I said, I said, there's a Catholic church down the street. I know the priest. I said, is he in confirmation? No. I said, enroll him for confirmation. He needs that sacrament. I said, has he made his first commitment? Yes. I said, he got to go to confession. He got to confess this thing with the with the Ouija board. I'm going to take it. Don't worry. I'll take you. I'm going to dispose of it. He's got to go to confession, take him, sign him up for confirmation, start taking him to mass every Sunday. And, uh, that was pretty much it. Uh, that was, that was, uh, that was the end of the call. Again, I think a lot of cops see this Eddie. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to process it. So you know what they usually do? They see stuff like this as diabolical. The, the shift ends, they go get a case of beer they go to the parking lot. And they go forget. And, and, they, and, and, and they drink their way to forgetfulness yeah. because of the awful things that they've seen. And, and, they, and they try to cover it up with jokes and F-bombs. That Dude, did you see what it... And Eddie, they're in pain. They're, 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 because they need Jesus. They need sanctifying grace, but they don't have it. So they'll get a case of beer and they'll, they'll joke about it till the wee hours of the night, talking about the horrendous things that their eyeballs have taken in. That's true, Jess. You know, here here are men living their lives at some of them in, in, in you know in, in a very very sinful way, Jess. Let's just be honest. A lot of these guys are not in, in, in God's grace. And when they see something like this, they're they're number one, they're shocked. Number two, they're not sure how to react, so they, they revert to their training. And and just like you said, our training does not involve spiritual things such as this and other things that happen out there. And so what happens is, like you said, uh, at the end of the day, they, they, they have to forget somehow. They, they drink. They have affairs. There's things going on that, uh, that are not very complimentary when we talk about it now, now that we're retired. But uh, the reality is just that, that uh, if they don't turn to Christ at some point in their life, these things are going to haunt them uh, until they're retired 
old men drinking at, at 70 years old, Jess, because they didn't turn to Christ, because they had the evidence, Jess. I mean, you and I, you know, we live kind of a similar life in, in those in that regard, that we were going through conversions while we were working the field. And, and the reality is, is that little by little, God gives you something at a moment in your life. Boom. You know, I'm listening to the radio. I'm, I'm, I'm coming closer to Christ. And all of a sudden you get something like this that happens and you start thinking, Man, I, I need to keep going to church, number one. Number two, uh, I, have to, I have to understand that there are things going on out here, especially out here, where policemen go that are not happening other places, you know, where, where there's situations occurring where people are running from those places. We as law enforcement just are running toward them. And so these are the kind of things that we see, we experience. And, uh, and sometimes for those people that are not in a state of grace, it turns out to be something uh, uh, horrific for them to uh, to live, and this is this is what we're talking about with with Jesus nine one one. We're talking about the reality of living these things, seeing these things, and not knowing how to react. Yeah, and and Eddie, I'll tell you, uh, even my son, my my oldest son, my firstborn, he he's a cop out here in Phoenix, and on tra- he's been off training for two years now. Now my youngest son is on training. Uh, but my oldest son, when he was on training two years ago, his training officer and his partner, you know, two veteran cops out there, my uh, my my son was uh, at the station writing a police report, and these two veteran Phoenix cops run in the station and talk to the watch commander, and he said, "Dad, they look like these they they look like they had seen hell." And uh, the watch the the watch commander called them in, and you know, these two veteran cops, very respected out here said, hey, uh, Sarge, we don't know how to process this. We just went to a family disturbance call. It was a Saturday night, and this young man was destroying the house. The family was trying to hold him down. He was beating up all the the the, the, the men. And this guy's like a skinny 13-, 14-year-old kid, you know, uh, pre, uh, barely going through puberty. And so they approached. Uh, the, the, the parent says, we made the call. Our son's destroying the house. He's beating everybody up. He's, he's, he's punching holes in the walls. Where's he at? He's over there in the hallway. They went to the hallway. They saw him. He was sitting down in a chair. These two veteran cops, a couple more guys came for backup. And uh, they said, hey, young man, uh, Phoenix Police Department, uh, we, we want to see your hands. Uh, l- show us your hands. They start walking t- towards him. He's in the hallway sitting on a chair. And all of a sudden, as they get about five feet from him, the chair levitates. Four feet off the ground. Four veteran Phoenix police officers see this. Again, Eddie, uh, this stuff is uh, this stuff is happening out there. I told my son, "What would you have done if you would have saw this?" He goes, "Dad, I would have been praying the Saint Michael the Archangel in a loop over and over again." I said, "Good man, I taught you well." That's it. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus nine one one. This is Jesse Romero. And I'm Terry Barber. From the Terry and Jesse Show. And we invite you to listen to the Holy Hour of Power, High Energy Catholic Radio. We're two Catholics with a PhD in common sense. We're on Monday through Friday on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. But we're going to give you is masculine Catholic teachings on the faith. You know, we say we're too inspired to be tired, we're too protected to be dejected, and we're too renewed to be subdued. Why? Because we believe in Jesus Christ and His Bride, the Church. And we will take each issue of the day and show you how the Catholic Church has the answer for our culture. What we really do is bring men back into the Catholic Church, which it's about time to do. We want men to be leaders in their Catholic faith so that they can bring their family to heaven. Our program is not right versus left, it's right right versus wrong and our program is where catholicism and culture intersect it's high energy catholic radio we're gonna inspire you to fall deeper in love with jesus christ and his bride to the church the terry and jesse show on the virgin most powerful app hi this is eddie chavez host of jesus 911 I want to take this opportunity to let you our listeners know about an event being held here at the sacred heart chapel in covina We will be celebrating the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel on September 28th, 2019, beginning at 9 o'clock with Mass in the morning and talks to follow. 
Ruben Nava and myself will be speaking. So come and hear us talk about St. Michael and Our Lady. Come join us. And we'll see you there. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Soul Patrol 10 Eddie, let me define levitation for people. They're probably wondering, man, what's these guys talking about? Hey, just real quick, before you go, I, want, I wanted to, to remind everybody, this weekend, this Saturday, is a, say, a feast of St. Michael the Archangel we're going to be uh, holding here. This event is free, so come join us. It'll be a, a, a lot of prayer, a lot of talk, mass. Absolutely. We'll be here, so thanks, uh, thanks be to God for that. You definitely want to go hear these guys speak, Eddie and Ruben, definitely. 30-some-odd years of law enforcement experience and serious Catholics that love Jesus and Our Lady. You definitely want to come down and hear these guys speak and be encouraged. Eddie, a lot of the saints have levitated in prayer. This is a phenomenon that happens to people that are very holy because they're so holy, it's like if God has already taken their body into heaven, body and soul. Like the, uh, It's like a, an assumption before the, before the, the last day. Yeah. They're so holy that God's already taking their body up like into the sky in prayer. It's happened to St. Father Pio, St. John Vianney, too many saints to, to mention. Now, the, the problem is, is that the devil Im, tries to imit, imit, uh, imitate God or ape God, as St. Augustine says. And so the devil will also use levitation for evil persons, possessed people, people that are demonized or spiritually afflicted, to imitate what God can do to the saints, but also to scare people. It's, it's meant to scare you. And, and there's another case, and I'm looking at it here. This happened in Indiana, okay? There was a mom with three kids. Her name's Latoya Amons, 32-year-old mother, Gary, Indiana. She had three children, and uh, she called the police department because a lot of s- strange things were happening in her house. So the cops came to the house, And uh, to see, you know, there was like strange smells and noises, all kinds of stuff. And so she called the police department. She she didn't know what else to do. She's a single mom with three kids. And the field officers, when they went there, they saw one of her boys, I think it was her 12, yeah, her 12-year-old daughter levitating in the house. And the boy started walking up and down the wall. Now, what do you do as a, as a street cop when you see that? <laughs> there's no, Des, there's nothing to do. That's the point. <laughs> the point of the story. Run to the Catholic Church. Yeah. That's what you tell her. Yeah. Exactly. So what happened is I, I, these guys are probably, they were probably rubbing their eyeballs like I did. And, and they went back to the station and they, they, they told the department, the captain says, yeah, right. Yeah, a kid was walking up. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody was levitating. So the police captain uh, of Gary Police Department, he comes to the house with the cops. Let me let me see what you guys are talking about. Totally not, total non-believer. The police captain with the cops and others that were brought from the station saw the girl levitate and the boy walk up and down the wall. The story ends kind of, it, it's good. I don't know which cop it was, but they ended up calling the Catholic priest. That's the way the story ends. A priest by the name of Father Michael Maginot. He, at first, you know, they brought in Ghostbusters, you know, some people, and right. probably made things worse. But eventually they brought in a Catholic priest. Uh, the article says he performed three exorcisms, two in English and one one in Latin. And uh, and all the, all the preternatural activities stopped. After the thirst, how, how to exorcism. 
And uh, the the family has uh, since moved out of that house, and they've moved into another location. Jess, you know, it's kind of funny because you, you examine this whole thing. And number one, <clears throat> the, the police did the right thing, right? They called the Catholic priest, and then they got the right guy. He did, <laughs> he did three exorcisms. One was in Latin, so that's perfect. But the, the, this is the reality, Jess, is what was the cause of these, both of her kids, uh, 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 you know, le- levitating and walking up the walls in this fashion? Now, you know, it's just my investigative mind that wants to figure this out because whatever was happening, it was enough that these kids were possessed uh, and they were accomplishing feats that we rarely see in cases such as this. And so there had to be something. And usually uh, t- people of this age just uh, don't don't avail themselves of things necessary to, uh, uh, to, 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 to make a demoniac out of them uh, very much. I mean, they can, but very rarely. So I'm thinking maybe mama, somebody had something going on in that house that allowed these children to be uh, afflicted in this way. And, uh, you know, we just pray, Jess, that, that uh, they move somewhere else and that uh, this, this same type of behavior wasn't repeated again. Because if not, right. you're going to have another PD rolling out to a, to a 415 family and these things are going to be, uh, <laughs> these things are yeah, going to happen again. Continue. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's nothing in police work that they've trained us to deal with this. Right. Okay? This is this, this, this only the Catholic church can really deal with this. And, uh, and that, and that's the fact Eddie, but, but there's a famous story. I, I think I've mentioned it before. You'll like it. Where St. Peter, the first Pope, he actually had a showdown with a magician who started levitating. Now, everybody knows the story about Simon Magus. He's, uh, he's, it's in the Acts of the Apostles. I think it's chapter 8. He was a magician who wanted to buy the Holy Spirit from the Apostles. And St. Peter rebuked him, says, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people b- believe that Simon Magus, because he was a magician, a lot of the, the Samaritans and a lot, a lot of the Jews believe that he was a god, you know, lowercase g, like, uh, like a little god. You can read about him in Acts chapter 8. Okay, his name's Simon Magus. He practiced, he practiced magic in the city. He astounded all the people of Samaria, a lot of the Jews. They thought he was somebody great. And then he, he saw the apostles performing miracles, and he wanted to buy, he wanted to buy this power from them. And, and Peter rebuked him. Okay, but here's, the, here's a part of the story that's not in the Bible. It's part of sacred tradition. It's part of Catholic tradition. Simon Magus, he confronts St. Peter, and they have a showdown in Jerusalem. And, uh, in fact, well, this story is actually found in, in, a, in, a, in a non-biblical work. It's called, it's called The Acts of Peter. It's, it's uh, one of those apocryphal works written back in the 2nd century. But it says that they, they faced each other off, and Simon Mag- Magus ch- chose Peter off, knowing that Peter was the vicar of Christ. And so Simon, Peter, uh, Simon Magus, the magician, he starts levitating in the air. Demons carry him. He levitates in the air. And he did this to scare St. Peter. So he's in the air right over Peter, hovering over Peter like a helicopter. St. Peter starts praying imprecatory prayers. I mean, he's the first pope. And the story goes that Simon Magnus, Magus, this, this, uh, this you know, dispelled the demons that were carrying Simon Magus. So he falls headlong to the ground, and he breaks his legs, and the people see that St. Peter has the true power of God, so the people rush in, and in, Jew- in good Jewish fashion, Eddie, they stone him to death. So that, that's a story that comes back from the second century of, uh, again, levitation being used against the first pope to try to scare him, and the per- first pope looked at him, like, looked it up up in the sky, yeah, right, did some imprecatory prayers, boom, fell on his head, and the people saw that Simon Peter was the one that had the authority of, of God, and uh, they stoned uh, the magician to death. And just, I think what we could take from that, one of the many things we could take from that was that the, 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 the power of the resurrection, this is actually you know a, a post-resurrection story, uh, but but Peter's already went through his doubts, Jess. Peter's went through his doubts when he when when he uh, denied Jesus three times. You know the, the the we all know the things that Peter lived through. But the reality is, Jess, is once you know the power of the resurrection, once you witness that, obviously in in, in some fashion, 
we don't witness it in uh, I we don't eyewitness it nowadays, but we do w- witness it to some degree. Uh, like you said, just at every mass, uh, you know what? The reality is there's a power there that, that yes, the apostles have that we don't have because they're ordained hands. They were ordained. ordained. However, you and I just are empowered to do much of the same stuff, especially in our own household, Jess, yes. especially in our own household. We can, yes. we can uh, battle those things. And that's the power that Jesus gives us in the resurrection. Yeah, the church has given us a lot of power. We just, it, but we all have to channel it in the right way. Yes. It's under our family, under those under our authority, under your domestic church, which is basically your your household. Uh, by the way, I just want to let you know that this Saturday I'm going to be in Fresno. For those of you that are out there, I'm going to be speaking at a Marian Eucharistic Conference this Saturday at Fresno from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. I uh, hope to see you there. And also, uh, for those of you that want to go to Poland with me, uh, want to take 50 hardcore Catholics to Poland, it's going to be an incredible time. Uh, it's going to be nine days in Poland. It's the it's the most Catholic country on planet Earth right now. I can't say enough about it. I think Poland will, will be the salvation of Europe if Europe is saved. May 13th to the 22nd. So if you want the flyer, go to my website, print it out. Uh, we're going to have Father Arturo Basan with us, a very young priest, young, holy Catholic priest doing the Latin Mass every single day. Uh, one of those uh, John Paul II priests that always wears his cassocks. I tease him, do you wear, do you wear your cassock even to bed? He goes, just about, Jesse. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the Poland trip, May 13th to the 22nd. And also, Eddie and Ruben are going to be speaking at the chapel this Saturday. Right, Eddie? That's right. Uh, Feast of St. Michael the Archangel. We're going to celebrate the feast. We're going to uh, talk. We're going to pray. We're going to say stories and have uh, uh, a talk about, about uh, Our Lady and uh, St. Michael the Archangel. And uh, it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a great time. It's a free event, so come on down. And also, today's the Feast of St. Padre Pio. So. Mm. Talk uh, talk about somebody else who levitated as well. Yeah, I've I've read that he levitated a few times during the holy sacrifice of the mass, uh, during the consecration. Uh, and so Saint Padre Pio, pray for us. Absolutely, Eddie, good yes. show. Yeah, good good show. I think we 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 hit a lot of the points that we needed to hit, Jess. I mean, people have to understand that when you open doors that are not available to to. <laughs> to God-believing Christians, Catholics, that uh, you invoke things that sometimes, most of the times, you're not equipped to handle. And that's when you have to come to the church. And that becomes a, a very elongated process sometimes. But on the other hand, uh, if if you just open a door uh, and, and you're unsure, the best way to attack it, Jess, the sacrament of confession, you get rid of the things that most people that come to the church end up, Fixing their problem through the sacrament of confession. That's right. The sacrament of confession closes the door. Yeah. Okay. And that's what we want to do. We want to keep the doors closed to the diabolical. Mortal sin, especially the occult, drugs, pornography, those three especially, open the door to the diabolical. We need to close the door to the diabolical by a conversion experience, a true, genuine giving your heart to Jesus, living in a state of grace, receiving confession and communion as often as possible, praying your daily rosary, reading your Bible. Keep those doors closed. Yes, what a beautiful faith we have. Who could not be a Catholic nowadays? I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for Gary Machuda on Hands-On Apologetics. We'll be back tomorrow. Same bad time, same bat, same Catholic time, same Catholic <laughs> channel. Got myself. God bless yeah. you. Take care. Saint Faustina's prayer for priests. O oh my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. 
Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us. <laughs> 